Hello everyone and welcome to Cool Aeronautics at Home 2021. We hope that you are all enjoying yourselves at home or at school and are still um, continuing your educational process wherever you are. Cool Aeronautics is hosted by the Royal Aeronautical Society and it is designed to, to provide a STEM and educational, educational resource to young people like yourselves who are at school who want to learn more about science, technology, engineer, engineering, and maths. We here at the Royal Aeronautical Society love to talk about aircraft and engineering, something that you would all have either, something, something that you would all have heard of. Many of you would, would have been on a plane on holiday, um, and many of you will see engineering all, all around you, whether it's um, builders building, building a building, there's a lot of engineering involved in that, whether you go to, a, um, to fix your car at a mechanic, there's also a lot of engineering involved in that. But aircraft and um, aviation and aerospace requires lots and lots of engineering. So it requires lots of people to come together to create, to create something magnificent. And that is how we get things like aircrafts and we get drones and we get even computers. So this is, um, Cool Aeronautics is designed to help, you, help all of you understand more about the world of aerospace and what it can bring for you. We at the Royal Aeronautical Society have been running Cool Aeronautics for over 10 years, and we have helped over, we have helped so many schools across the UK and abroad in um, realizing the, the students' young potential um, and, in, and engaging them and educating them about our fascinating industry. We are, as part of this Cool Aeronautics, our, our, our mission is to bring, is to, bring to you a collection of, of fantastic speakers who currently work in aviation or aerospace. Some can be pilots, some can be engineers, some can even work in the space industry. And our job is to, is for you to, our job is to bring their stories to you. So we've got three fascinating, fascinating speakers who are going to be talking to you today about their roles in the in industry and how their roles play a huge part in ensuring the success of aerospace and aviation. So today we've decided to do something a bit different and bring in three, three different sort of roles um, within the industry that, may, that, that are very different to your normal pilot, engineer, and space engineer. We've gone, we've gone to, we wanted to diversify this time. And what we've done is we've picked three fantastic speakers. Our first speakers, Dr. Karen Joyce and Paul Mead, who are joining us all the way from Australia. They're going to talk to you about something called drones. Some of you may have heard of them. Some of you may have played video games which include drones, but they are going to talk to you about the importance of drones and what they are and how they can be used in our everyday lives going forward. We will also have a talk from Christopher Jeeves and Nicole Colavati, who are, who are working for Euro Control. Now they are air traffic controllers. When you go to an airport, you will often see a large tall tower. And that is where air traffic controllers work. And their job is to guide aircraft through the skies and ensure that all the all ensure that all of you are kept safe whilst you are in the aircraft to ensure that you get to your holiday destination holiday destination at the correct time and you get there in a, you get there in one piece. We've also got with us a maintenance engineer from Airbus who is who is known as Steph, who is called Steph Smith. Steph has been working for Airbus for several years now, and she will talk to you about how, how she has to fix aircraft on a daily basis and meet certain targets to ensure that, that the aircraft can fly when needed, um, especially in, in, the, in the British military. Along with this, um, this talk, we also have our Cool Aeronautics Activity Packs, which have been designed for children like yourselves, whereby you can learn more about what we have talked about today. This will all be kindly available. This will all be available through, through the links on our careers, careers in aerospace and aviation website. And you'll be able to find out a lot more about um, UAVs. Um, you'll be able to find out a lot about air traffic controlling um, and how, how important that role is. And you'll also be able to find out more about the day, a day in the life of a maintenance engineer and what and what is required. Um, don't forget that um, we are on Twitter, so you can always catch us on um, at RAES Careers and follow us for further updates on there. We also have our Careers in Aerospace website, um, which we will, um, which we, which we will be load, which we'll be loading all of the um, the packs onto. Um, this website is www.careersinaerospace.com, and you 
it, you'll be able to go on there and um, start your journey um, into our industry from there. But for the meantime, we'd very much like to thank SheMaps. We would we are very grateful to Eurocontrol, and we are grateful to Airbus um, as uh, as they have as the, their personnel have kindly given up their time for us um, today. So moving on, the first people I would like to uh, to to invite to come and come and speak to you, and I'm really really looking forward to this one, is Dr. Karen Joyce and Paul Mead from SheMaps. Now they are actually in Australia, however. Due to the world that we are living in now, we've made it possible for them to come on and um, talk to you all about UAVs and the importance of them and all of their work that they do, the fantastic work that they do um, within Australia, but also internationally to promote STEM and um, the education of um, unmanned aerial vehicles to schools all over the world. So without further ado, uh, Karen and Paul, over to you. Oh, thanks. Or should I just get my slides up? Thanks so much, Rishi. It is absolutely fantastic to be here with you, the teachers and students here today. So I hope that you have all got your flying hats on because we are going to get ready to take off with drones and into the future. We believe that drones are part of the future. And what we're talking about here today is a few things with drones. I'm a drone instructor with She Maps. I'm also a teacher, and I'm also going to talk to you about a book that I wrote called Pepper and Drony. I've got a special guest that we're going to introduce you to very, very shortly as well. Now, as Rishi, you said, we're joining you all the way from Australia in a place called Cairns, and Cairns is right on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, some of you might have heard of the Great Barrier Reef, and we'll learn a little bit more about that very, very shortly. But first, I have got a question for all of you. What does a scientist look like? So I want you to imagine maybe that you're playing a game of Pictionary. So Pictionary, if you haven't heard of it, is a game where you have to draw something on a bit of paper for your partner to try and guess what it is you're drawing. So I want you to imagine that you've just drawn a card out of that pack of, uh, pack of cards and on that card it says, scientist. How would you draw your scientist? What would they be wearing? What are they doing? Where are they located? Have they got something in their hands? What about on their face? What does their face look like? So if you've got a really clear picture in your mind, I want you to keep this to yourself and I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions to see if I can guess what your scientist looks like. So my first question, does your scientist wear a lab coat? Now is your scientist doing chemistry? Do they have test tubes and beakers? Are they doing things with chemicals? Now, many of you might, uh, might have already said yes to that already. What about your scientists? Are they wearing glasses? Well, maybe your scientist has crazy Albert Einstein type hair. Now, I bet that most of you have said yes already. And my last question is, is your scientist a man? Because most people, when they think of a scientist, they think of chemistry. They think of white lab coats. And many people don't think that there's diversity in science or STEM. But I want to challenge you today to think about all the different types of science that are out there and what sort of people do science. And we're going to introduce you to a few of these different types of science here today. Now, just like there's lots of different sciences around, there's lots of different ways that drones are used as well. And this here is a diagram of all of the different, uh, or the diversity of the drones being used in the workforce. You can see that there's lots out there. It doesn't matter if you're a software developer or whether you are maybe a drone pilot, that's fantastic, but there's also drones being used in events and shows, 
We've seen drones being used as light shows at the Olympics. We've been seeing drone shows uh, used by Lady Gaga in some of her music videos. So even if you're into that really creative artistic space, drones are being used there as well. So drones are the future. They're being used all over the place to help us solve problems. And there's many scientists that are using drones as well. And there's many people that work on beaches here in Australia that help to keep people safe. So for public safety, you can even get coffee and burritos delivered by drone in one of our cities here uh, in our capital city, Canberra in Australia as well. But what I wanted to talk to you about now is this book that I wrote called Pippa and Droning. Now, Pippa made her drone in her, her school makerspace and she called her droning. And Pippa, she went on an adventure with droning around the country. She went to Sydney to visit Dr. Vanessa, where she saw, and Dr. Vanessa is a scientist who researches whales and flies drones through whale snot to assess how healthy those whales are. She went and worked with one of our indigenous rangers to look at uh, how, keeping their land healthy. And she also went some, and spent some time with Dr. Karen on the Great Barrier Reef to learn about the science that Karen does. So Dr. Karen does research on the Great Barrier Reef to create maps of corals. And we're gonna hear from Dr. Karen and exactly what she does in a little bit more detail in a second. And this here is a fantastic picture of Dr. Karen on the reef in the book. Can you see some of the animals in that picture? What can you see? I can see turtles, I can see stingrays, I can see coral reef, I can see fish, I can see some sea cucumbers and some starfish there as well. So I really want to introduce you now to our other special guest here, Dr. Karen, who is a geospatial scientist, and she uses drones to research on the Great Barrier Reef. So Dr. Karen, are you there? Can we uh, hear about what it is that you do with drones on the Great Barrier Reef? Hi everyone. Thanks Paul for calling me in and thanks everyone for, for joining us here today. Really exciting to be here. So as you can see in my background, I'm on Heron Reef on the Great Barrier Reef. That's one of my favorite places to be. So amazing to be able to stand on the beach and look out at the coral reef and fly my drone to make maps. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I do as part of my work as a geospatial scientist. So I'm interested in the Great Barrier Reef. I wonder if any of you have actually been to the Great Barrier Reef or if you've been snorkeling or diving on any coral reef. It's a pretty exciting place to be. The Great Barrier Reef, as you can see behind me here, is this really long area off the coast of Queensland in Australia. And it's actually really quite big. It's about the size of Italy. It's a really, really large area and it's made up of 3,000 individual coral reefs. So it's not just one really big one, it's individual ones, lots and lots of reefs. And I'm really curious to know how much live coral we have there, because particularly when we're a little bit concerned about climate change and what's happening in the oceans, it's really important for us to understand what we have and how that changes over time. But I'm going to take you in to a small part down the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef here. And so this is just off my shoulder, just about here. So let's come down here and to the little reef that I've got the arrow on up the top there. Now this is Heron Reef. So this is one of my favourite places to go for work. I feel really privileged to be able to go and work out on a coral reef, right? It's a pretty amazing place to be. So if you can see Heron Reef behind me, if you imagine it's kind of like an upside down dead rat. 
So can you see that? So the eye of the rat is actually an island. So it's quite a small island. It's 800 meters long. So about the size of if you were to run around twice around an athletics track, it's about the length of the island. And in the, the north-south direction is, is about 400 meters. So just once around your athletics track. It's a pretty small. There's a forest there. There's a research station and a resort as well. And now the rest of the reef is where all the coral is and lots of other different types of habitats as well. So we have coral, we have algae, we have sand, rock and lots and lots of different critters that live on the reef as well. And so what you see behind me is a satellite image like what you might see on Google Earth. And we're going to go in all the way up to the island and let's go in and have a little bit of a closer look because see if we can see some live coral there. So let's see, I wonder if you can tell me where the live coral is in this picture. Do you think you can see it? It's a little bit hard, isn't it? So it's a bit hard to tell that we see some dark patches, some light patches, but it's hard to tell if is it live coral? Is it algae? Maybe it's dead coral? I don't really quite know. So let's see what happens if instead of being on a satellite looking down, what if we flew a drone and had a look instead? And this is really quite amazing because all of a sudden now we go into that same area but we're so much closer with our camera that we actually can see all the individual corals. And we can zoom in even more. Let's go in a little bit closer. Now, hopefully you can see the live coral around the edges. So it's the, the brown bits around the edge of all these coral bombies. And so this is what I can use to start to try to understand just how much live coral we have on the Great Barrier Reef. We can go in a little bit closer because it's always fun to actually go under the water too. And so this is what the coral looks like when we're underwater. Now this is called a branching coral because it's got lots of branches, lots and lots of beautiful coral here. And what I do as part of my job is then to have a look at some of the drone photos that I take and see if I can figure out, so where is all this live coral? Because I take thousands and thousands of pictures like the one you see behind me. And for me to be able to work out how much live coral there is, it's pretty good to be able to see if I can tell a computer what live coral looks like and see if the computer can figure it out as well. This is what we call artificial intelligence. So we've got intelligence in our own minds, but if we can train a computer to think like us and pick up these sorts of things, it can do it really, really quickly. And so that's part of my job. So I, I have to teach the computer what coral looks like and what the different other types of habitats look like as well. And this is what the computer then tells me. So all the bits of green that you can see behind my head, that's where the live coral is. And so that I can now do this across the reef and figure out how much live coral we've got all together. So how do you think it does this? It's pretty tricky, right? Well, one of the things that's really important is that these photos take pictures of colour. So just like a photo might, might do on if you've used a phone to take a photograph or, or a camera, they're all picking up different bits of light. And when we look at coral, if we look at, say, a healthy coral here, it's got healthy tissue and, and inside the tissue of the coral is chlorophyll. So this is like a tree and the chlorophyll photosynthesizes and provides food for the coral, right? If the temperature gets too hot in the water, the coral decides that it doesn't like this chlorophyll anymore and it spits it out. And instead you have what's closer to what's here behind me is bleached coral. So it no longer has this chlorophyll in its tissue, but then the problem is that it's spat out its food source so the coral can starve and then eventually die. But what we can see and how we can use photos to measure and then map this is that they're two very different colours. So we've got this brownish colour, which is healthy, and the white, which is not healthy. So we can use special instruments that actually measure this colour. And then that can tell us, is it healthy coral? Is it, is it live coral? Is it dead coral? Is it sand? Is it algae? These special instruments that we can use will measure that for us. And then we can even put those instruments on a drone as well. So a really, really small instrument that you can see just flying just underneath my drone there. And that makes, me, makes these measurements as well. And ultimately, 
that can tell me how much live coral I have on the Great Barrier Reef. So just to finish, I thought I would leave you with an amazing drone photo of lots of different types of live coral, some beautiful purples and yellows, some hard coral, some soft coral, lots and lots of different types. So I hope you enjoy looking at that picture. Thanks very much, Paul. Back to you. Thanks so much, Karen. That's absolutely fascinating and all the work that you're doing with your drones on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I have got a challenge for you all. I would like to know, what would your drone look like if you were solving a problem? Now, I've got a few friends here that have designed their own drones. We've got some who have designed a drone to rescue animals from fires. Another one here that's a doggy drone that walks your dog for you and picks up the dog poop. Uh, another one that's like a, a bird and it helps to uh, measure how many birds we've got uh, in the environment. And another one there that detects heat and smoke so that people to have time to put their fires out. These are all awesome uses of drones. So maybe you could uh, draw a drone for me and design, what would your drone do? What problems would it solve? I'd love to see them. And if you send them on to me, I'll, uh, I'll share them with some of my friends as well. And now Karen makes maps as well. And I've got another challenge for you. It's called Map My School. So we would like to know how much shade have you got on your school grounds? Here's some friends that have uh, made some maps for me. And there's three ways that you can really create some maps. And we've got some resources here for your teachers to help you out. There's the first one, which is uh, a hand-drawn map. And you've been able to use some glad wrap or some, uh, some other plastic, put over the top and make your map and work out how much shade is on your school grounds. We've got another one that uses a tool called Scribble Maps. And I reckon that many of you uh, would be able to do this really, really well. And another one using Google Earth Engine. So if you like are into your coding, this one might be fantastic for you as well. Alrighty, so there's a couple of challenges for you. Now, teachers, we've got all the resources for you there if you would like to uh, get them. Those resources are all free. If you go to our website, shemaps.com, or you go to uh, careersinaerospace.com, and all of our resources will be there uh, for you after this presentation as well. Rishi, thank you so much for having Karen and I uh, here. We really love getting our Drones flying with you all. Back to you, Rishi. Paul and Karen, thank you so much. It was so fantastic to hear about all your work with um, UAVs. And yes, you are very lucky, very, very lucky to live on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, if, if, no, if you've never been, it is, it is the most, one of the most fascinating places in the world for its range of um, habitats, and especially if you enjoy um, looking at different sort of animals, um, the, the Great Barrier Reef is so, so amazing and it's definitely worth the trip. So Paul and Karen, you're so lucky to, to be where you are. And I wish I was, I wish I was over there, over there um, all the time because I, I think I really, really thoroughly enjoy it. But what we've learned um, from, from uh, Dr. Karen and Paul is that drones have such um, an important use in our daily lives. They're used in areas that we would never, ever really consider, consider them to be used. And drones, and as Paul in Paul is Paul, Paul said, um, drones are certainly the future. And so kids, you'll see a lot more drones in your lifetime throughout the years, even from delivering your packages to um, delivering your food. Um, and I think uh, this is going to be a real, real reality. So it's very important for you to know about what they are and how important they will be um, in the future of your life. So uh, Karen and Paul, thank you so much once again. Um, it was really, really lovely to hear, hear your stories. And um, if you if you want to get any further guidance on on drones and um, the, the fantastic work that SheMaps does, you can always head over to our careers in aerospace uh, website where all of these resources will be available to you. Now moving on, we've got another set of fantastic speakers for you. And uh, many of you have been on an aircraft, and you know that on an aircraft there are pilots and there are cabin crew who come and serve you food, but are also there to keep you safe. But how are all the aircraft um, controlled in the skies? Have you ever wondered that? 
do the pilots just make a decision on where they want to fly and what route they want to take? Um, surely, if that, what if two or three aircraft wanted to take the same route and fly at the same height? Have you ever considered what may happen? It could be disaster, right? So there are always, whenever you're on an aircraft, just think about how many people are involved in getting you, getting you into the sky and also keeping you there safely. As part of this, many of you, um, as I mentioned, have been to an airport before, and you've probably seen a really tall tower with, where there are actually people working in the tower. But have you ever considered why, have you ever asked yourself why this tower is there? So this tower is actually there, um, is known as air traffic control and they there are people working in there who are very very highly trained and their job is to make sure that all the aircraft are flying flying safely in the skies above us to make sure that there are no accidents and to ensure that air, that you get to your place on time and you get there in one piece air traffic controlling is such a fascinating job job because it requires a lot of focus um, it requires a lot of uh, working together and it also um, requires a lot of patience at times. So the air traffic controller's job is so important in keeping you safe and taking you to where you want to be. They are a lifeline for pilots and they're also a lifeline for all of these vehicles and um, vehicles that you see moving around the airport. They have full, full um, control of predominantly all movements that happen on an airport. And um, it's important to consider the number of people that are at work behind the scenes to get you to your holiday. So without further ado, I've actually, we've actually got air traffic controllers here with us who are going to speak to you more about their role. So without further ado, um, from Euro Control, please can we kindly welcome Christopher Jeeves and Nicole Colavati. Over to you. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you Rishi for such a great uh, introduction. So my name is uh, Chris, I work at an organization called Eurocontrol. Now, Eurocontrol is a, is a fantastic big organization uh, dealing with all sorts of things relating to aviation in Europe. And uh, we're actually pretty big. We have 41 countries who are, who is a member of the organization. And we do lots of interesting things. Uh, we, have an in, we have a headquarters in, uh, in Brussels. And uh, just for an example, if you're sitting on the, the tarmac uh, in your aircraft when, when waiting to go on your summer holiday and uh, the pilot comes on and says, uh, I'm sorry, but we've got five minutes of uh, delay. Well, I'm afraid that's our organization planning that delay and keeping your pilot on the ground uh, to make sure that everything is uh, safe in the air. We also have a training school in Luxembourg. We do research and development in Paris. And then I work uh, together with Nicole, who you meet in a moment, um, in probably the best and the most interesting part of the agency. Uh, and that is Maastricht Upper Area Control Center. So Maastricht is in uh, Holland, the Netherlands, and we are active air traffic controllers, and we work in this area here. So in, in pretty much the busiest area of Europe. But I'm sure you're asking yourself the question, and lots of people do, what actually is air traffic control? So now I'd like to ask Nicole to join us. She's one of our star air traffic controllers from Italy. Uh, to explain what the job really is. Hello everyone and thank you so much for having me uh, today. As Chris kindly introduced me, I'm an air traffic controller from Italy. Um, I joined Eurocontrol when I was just out of high school. Uh, I was 19 years old and I became a fully qualified controller about two and a half years later. Um, now that I'm a little bit older, I feel like I gained enough experience to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, I would like to ask you to picture a busy city, a busy town with lots of roads, lots of crossroads, lots of cars, buses, scooters. Think about that and try and place that into the sky. Now, the role of air traffic controller is rather simple, but to explain, but hard to execute. What we do is um, try to ensure that all this traffic that in the sky become airplanes manages to get through their destination safely. Um, the peculiarity about our job and the difference, the main difference between airplanes and cars is that airplanes, once they're up in the sky, they cannot stop. And uh, as um, it was mentioned earlier in the introduction, um, it often happens that a lot of aircraft like to fly on the same route at the same time. 
which mm -hmm. means that they create conflicts. Um, and uh, as an air traffic controller, we have to make sure that these conflicts don't actually turn into accidents. Now, there's uh, not only that uh, that happens in the sky. Often there is uh, some unusual occurrences, such as uh, weather that we have to deal with. Uh, there is, uh, you know, you probably see some big clouds, some big funnel clouds that uh, certainly aircraft need to avoid. It can even happen that there's some volcanic ash in the sky, which would ultimately damage the engine of the aircraft, and uh, we have to navigate them around this. There is turbulence. You might have experienced that if you travel sometimes, that pilots don't quite like flying through because it might spill a few coffees or cause even worse damage. So all these little factors we need to consider and uh, make sure that uh, not only we avoid accidents, but we also make the flight as comfortable as possible. Um, there's uh, also Sometimes there's uh, some even more dangerous situations that might happen and we need to deal with, um, which is, uh, for example, some aircraft malfunction or some disruptive passengers that might compromise the safety of the flight. So we need to gather as, ma as much information as possible and uh, make sure that uh, everybody's aware of what's going on and uh, try to help the pilots to our best to make sure that uh, they land safely. Thank you, Nicole. That was really super interesting. Can you maybe tell us just um, how did you become a controller? What was your training like? Oh, the training is uh, not an easy task, I'll tell you. Um, as I said, I just came out of high school and um, I was looking for opportunities. I had a bit of an idea of becoming a fighter pilot. Then uh, I stumbled upon the Air Control website, luckily. And I applied, passed a long selection process for which I had to prepare quite thoroughly. But the main thing is just be yourself and uh, you manage to get through. Um, after that, after the selection, uh, I was invited to follow a course. At the time, it was held in Luxembourg. As Chris mentioned, we have an institute there that uh, provides us with uh, the appropriate education. However, now they moved the course down to Toulouse in the southern France. Um, and uh, it's very, very close to actually the Airbus factory. They have a big university there and uh, our student controllers uh, gather uh, at the beginning of the course and they receive their education there. Now, after passing a long series of exams, I was accepted into Maastricht where I began my simulator training. Of course, you're not just put into live traffic straight away. You have to first follow a bit of a simulator course, pass more exams, learn the airspace, learn the maps, learn all about different aircraft types and the performance. And once you're ready, you are invited to join the ops room and there you will be working live traffic. Uh, it's very important to know that when you're a trainee, there will always, always be somebody right next to you, ready to take over in case you're in, uh, facing any kind of difficulty, in case you have questions, they will answer your questions. So um, when, the coach, when the coach realizes or uh, establishes that you are good enough, then uh, you will be asked to perform a checkout run. And if successful, then you will be able to work by yourself and uh, control the traffic on your own. Of course, it's worth noting that you are never, ever, ever by yourself in our job. There's always a group of people around you. You always work with somebody and uh, you can always ask for help if you need it. It's nice to hear. It's, it's a super responsible job. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it, it's good to know that everybody is trained so highly to do it. I don't think people really realize uh, how much impact the controller has on the way the aircraft flies. Everyone thinks the, aircraft, the pilots are doing the steering. And in fact, it's the controller telling the pilot, turn left, turn right, go up, go down. So, uh, so yeah, nice job. And last comment, now that, you're now that you are an established controller, um, how do you develop in your job? Well, each air traffic controller never stops learning. We, we are offered Every year we have to do a refresher course uh, where some instructors will tell us, oh, this is new. You probably should look back into this. 
there is this new procedure that you need to follow um, and so on. Apart from that, this is something that every controller has to do to maintain their proficiency. Uh, it's a mandatory course. And um, aside from that, you always have the opportunity to develop yourself further, to learn more. There's plenty of courses that you can take um, because of course the aviation environment, as mentioned by the previous speakers, there's always something new. There's always something new coming along. Now we have the development of drones. Um, we have uh, new concepts for what concerns the environment. So there, there will always be something interesting to look into. And uh, being an air traffic controller, you are awarded the luxury of time. So if you are interested, you will always be having the time and the opportunity to follow any kind of courses and uh, further your education. For example, what I did, I'm very interesting in, interested in uh, human performance. So I decided to join the university in the UK and gain my degree after, uh, after having become a controller. So why not? There's always plenty of opportunities. Fantastic, good for you. Well, Thank you. I hope we've uh, given, given everyone a bit of a view of what it's like to uh, do air traffic control. And we'd like to finish up by showing you one quick video um, of the course that our students take. So, over the video. Back to you. Well, thank you so much um, to Chris and Nicole for taking time out of your busy schedule um, to talk to us all about your fascinating roles um, as um, working in air traffic control. Now, kids, I'm sure you realise after that how important air traffic control is to keep you safe. And safety is always the number one priority in aviation. And it is actually down to the air traffic controllers to keep you safe. So it's a huge, huge responsibility. And, um, and if, you, if you've got a job with large responsibility, think about it, you'd want to be, you'd want to have, you'd want to go through a lot of training, wouldn't you, to ensure that you are able to handle that responsibility. In order, you're able to make the right decisions and also um, you're able to stay calm when things get busy. And believe me, at air traffic, at air traffic control, it can get very, very busy. So if you are going to take on that sort of responsibility, you want to ensure that you are at your best. And that is what uh, companies like Eurocontrol do uh, to ensure that air traffic, air, air traffic controllers are at the very best of standards. Aviation and aerospace, um, as both Chris and Nicole mentioned, is always changing. And that means that the people have to change, often change the way they work in order to adapt to new situations and new rules and regulations. 
So being an air traffic controller is a very, it's a very rewarding role. And there's so much, uh, so much to learn as an air traffic controller. And you can also use this in your, take this responsibility into your own lives as well. And um, just um, behave more respons responsibly and make better decisions for yourself. So Chris and Nicole, thank you once again. So thank you so much once again for that um, fascinating insight into um, air traffic control and um, your, your journey to getting there. Um, and I think it's, it's, so, um, it's so insightful to learn about the actual importance of air traffic control and where the job can take you. So thank you so very much. Moving on to our next speaker. You've always, we, you, you always fly in an aircraft. Um, you have pilots and cabin crew, as mentioned before. But what if something goes wrong with those aircraft? Who, they need to be fixed, don't they? So in order to do that, you need engineers on the ground who are prepared um, day and night to prepare the aircraft to fix any problems that, you may, that, that, that the aircraft may have. If you fly on an aircraft that is faulty, you, you, may not, you, may, you, um, you may not get to your destination. And therefore, it is important to have people constantly looking at these aircraft to make sure that they are, they are okay to fly. And for that, we have, um, we, have, uh, we have our very own Steph Smith, who is an aircraft engineer, and she works for Airbus. Um, she's based at Rise Norton, which is not actually, which is not a, um, a place to go on holiday. Rise Norton is for our UK military, and they look after a lot of aircraft, um, which the military use to transport, um, to transport cargo and personnel um, around the world to go on various missions and consignments. So we're going to hear from Steph, um, who has been an aircraft engineer for many, many years um, and worked in very uh, many, many various roles. Steph also has a huge passion for flying herself, especially gliders, which you'll get to hear about. So without further ado, Steph, over to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Steph Smith. And as Rishi introduced me, I am an aircraft engineer. So what is an aircraft engineer? Quite simply, we're the people that you never notice lurking around the airport or on the military bases. We're the ones that keep aircraft safe and fit for flying. If you do notice us when you're going on holiday, it probably means we're just trying to get you away without a delay. Just be nice to us, smile and wave. We do appreciate it. So I currently work for Airbus, looking after the A400M at RAF Bryars Norton. I've been doing that now since 2017, but I've been in the aviation industry since 2009. What inspired me to be an engineer? I've, I've grown up around aviation. I started flying gliders when I was 10. I've grown up on airfields and going to air shows. And my dad was really into aircraft as well. So naturally it was passed down to me to also fall in love with aircraft. So why am I in it? What do I love most about being an aircraft engineer? Every day it's different. I never know what I'm going to be walking into when I turn up at work. And the most rewarding part of it is helping the next generation coming through, getting their experience up, teaching them what we know about the aircraft and just passing the love of the job on. So my typical day will start at either six in the morning or six in the evening, depending which shift I'm on. We get to work, say hi to everybody, and then we'll sit and have a briefing where you have a look at what's happened that day, what aircraft are flying, what's going to be flying next and have a look at any of the defects that have come back with the aircraft. So aircraft fly with a logbook. So when the pilots find a problem, they'll write it down so that when it gets back, the engineers can investigate it for them. To look at the defects, we have manuals that tell us if you find this problem, you follow these steps. So really, you don't have to have a wonderful memory of how things work. You just have to have a good understanding when you read instructions and be able to follow step-by-step -step guides on how to do things. So as you can see in these photos, I've given you some examples of things we do. Um, the top left, we've got up on staging, looking down on an aircraft so you can see some of the panels removed. The middle one on the top row shows the aircraft has actually been lifted by jacks. So that now means that they can put all of the wheels up or if they need to, they can change all of the wheels at the same time. It, you probably didn't know that aircraft have to be regularly weighed and this could be part of that process as well. 
the top right photo shows you the biggest downfall of the job. We have to go out in all weathers. If it's snowing or raining, thunderstorms, or even if it's lovely and hot and sunny, we're out all the time working in all of those conditions. So common jobs we do, we do a lot of changing igniters on engines. Simply that's like the spark plugs in a car. It's what keeps the engine running and starts it. We'll replace a lot of wheels because just like your car, tires wear out. You think how much work they go through every time they take off and land, it does burn the rubber pretty quickly. We do a lot of preparing aircraft for military missions and deployments. So that changes what we need to look for. So we're forecasting forward, looking at how long the aircraft has got in hours or flight cycles, and just making sure it's got enough time left on the aircraft before maintenance is due. Some days we get exciting work. We could do things like the aircraft has landed on a beach. And that brings about lots of inspections looking for sand. And let me tell you, when the aircraft's landed on the beach, there is a lot of sand and it has gone everywhere. We also find things like the aircraft have struck birds in flights, sort of generally on takeoff or landing. And some days when the weather's bad, you'll find they might have been struck by lightning, which then involves a lot of searching across the entirety of the aircraft, trying to find the little burn marks where the lightning has come in and out of the aircraft. As an engineer, I'm responsible for a team. So I have mechanics and technicians that work for me. So not only am I responsible for signing off my own work, I'm responsible for ensuring they've done their work properly as well. So there's a lot of responsibility in the job and it's not something to be taken lightly. The pleasure of doing that though is I get to sign off people's logbooks, which then means they then qualify to do my role as well. So it's very rewarding to see people progress over the years. The A400M um, during the pandemic has been used globally by all of the nations that fly them. We've been transporting vital cargo. So we've been flying vaccines out to remote locations and we have the capability to be a flying hospital to move critically ill patients. And the advantage of the aircraft is it can be landed on remote locations, on beaches, unmade runways, so we can access places that some other aircraft can't. Before I worked for Airbus, I, was a, I worked for British Airways. I started off there as a mechanic and finished my exams and gained the experience I needed to be promoted to a technician and then finally to a licensed aircraft engineer. During my time at BA, I worked on 777s, 747s, 767s and 787s. The latter being my favourite as that was the first aircraft I got on my licence. I started my time working in the hangar on scheduled maintenance. So that's things that need doing every month, every six months. It's repetitive work, but it's a good way to build up your hand skills and learn the aircraft. After that, I was then given a course to learn all about the 787. So that was 12 weeks in the classroom where you learn exactly how the aircraft works, studied the systems and got some practice in the simulators before you were let loose to go and work on the aircraft itself. That then led me to working on the line at Terminal 5 at Heathrow. So when you see all the little people buzzing around outside in their yellow jackets, you have the refuelers, there'll be the loaders putting your baggage on the aircraft, there'll be the dispatchers, and then you'll be the engineers. You can see like in the top right photo, he'll be looking at parts of the aircraft to make sure that it is safe for you to fly. And again, that's out in all the weathers, in the rain, but you're also treated to things like that beautiful sunrise in the bottom right hand photo. So during my time at BA, we got to do some exciting things as well. So if an aircraft is poorly and has to be landed in a different country, sometimes teams of engineers are flown out to work on it there to get it back safely. So that can be anywhere. You could be out in Africa, you could be in different part of the UK, if it has to divert to say Scotland or something, if there's not an engineer there, teams will be flown out to it. The most interesting thing I got to do at BA that not many people get to say is I actually made a set of curtains for the Queen's VIP flight. The night before the flight, it was discovered the Queen did not have the curtains for her changing area. So as the woman on the shift, it was noticed that I will probably be able to sew. So I helped the team make a set of curtains so the Queen could comfortably have some privacy on her flight. So how do you become an aircraft engineer? 
I did a course with Newcastle Aviation Academy, which is in Newcastle upon Tyne. And that was a degree. It was a two year full time course where you did a foundation degree, but it also gave you the engineering exams you needed to get the engineer's license. If you want, you can then top that up to a bachelor's degree at the end, which I did a few years after I started working when I had more experience. Newcastle Aviation Academy has a really good reputation with employers in the aviation industry. They've got a very good network of friends and other companies that they work with. So students coming out of there are highly regarded. The best part of Newcastle Aviation Academy is they actually have their own Boeing 737 that when you do your practical work, you are working on the aircraft. So you've learned already how to work on an aircraft before you get out into the real world. But if you don't want to go to university, you really do not have to go to university to be an aircraft engineer. If studying is not your thing and you just want to get out and work in the real world, there are other options. You can join the military and go through their training programs as technicians. This is what the people I work with now do, and they are just as good as everybody that's been for university, if not better, because they've had some experiences that the rest of us would never got a chance to do. There are also apprenticeships where you can go straight in with working with airlines. And there's even some apprenticeships available now where you can work for the likes of Shuttleworth or Duxford and do your apprenticeships on vintage aircraft. The last option is to go straight in as a mechanic with no experience. However, at the moment, these option, that option is not widely available, but maybe when the industry recovers, it will come back again. So when you think of aircraft engineers, you probably don't think there are this many different types of engineer you can be. So as an aircraft engineer, you could go down the route of looking after helicopters. You could look after general aviation, the small aircraft that you see flying around the skies all the time. You could look after business jets. You could look after gliders. You could do vintage aircraft and work your way around the air show circuit. You could join the military, or you could, like myself, work for the military as a civilian contractor. Or you could go into commercial aviation and look after aircraft for airlines. So I've already told you a little bit about my history. My love of aviation began flying gliders when I was 10. I skipped school on my 16th birthday and went solo. My form tutor knew exactly where I was. I talked about it for months before. And gliding is a wonderful way to get into aviation. It's the cheapest way to learn to fly. There's lots of financial support out there to get young people flying. And the best part is it's what really gave me the understanding of how things fly and how they work, which has given me the knowledge I needed to be a good aircraft engineer. Being an aircraft engineer has led me to be able to do many new and exciting things. For one, supporting the Aeronautical Society at physical events and doing online events like this, reaching out to people, letting them know what my role is and how you can get involved. I'm also very passionate about women in aviation projects. So I'm part of the British Women Pilots Association where we support women of all ages and all skill sets trying to get into aviation and all types of flying. If you ever wanted to fly a hot air balloon, a microlight, a glider, the world is your oyster. There are so many things out there. I've learned lots of new skills, done lots of training courses. And being involved with this, you get to meet some of the most amazing people across the aviation industry in roles you've never even heard of. And you get to learn so many interesting things and it's the most sociable group of people I have ever met. So last year I decided I wanted to gain my PPL. So I started training to fly small general aviation aircraft. And I've done this because I would like to be an aircraft accident investigator one day. So my engineering experience and flying experience is what I need to get that role. And as everybody has said, you never stop learning when you work in aviation. There's always going to be a new piece of technology coming out, a new aircraft, a new skill to learn. So aviation is forever learning, but it's good learning and you love every single moment of it. So that's me. So thank you very much for listening. And remember, pick a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Steph. It was so fantastic and um, inspiring to hear your story about how you always had a passion for aviation 
and you always you knew from a young age that this was um this was the industry that you wanted to work in um and it's so it's so fantastic to see that you followed that passion all the way through um throughout your teenage years and through to your adult life and um life is all about learning and you are constantly learning um every every minute every day every year there is you are constantly always learning something new and that 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 constant learning gives you experience over time invaluable experience over time that will help you um in your job going going forward throughout your later years and i agree with 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 Steph when she says that um the aviation bunch are the most friendliest bunch i think um that you can come across i certainly agree with that um this is such a friendly industry um and we're very very fortunate to uh, be a part of it um but one thing i learned um from one thing i think all of you children should learn from step is about um the importance of following your passion if you have a passion be it be it in whatever whatever you want to be um follow your passion and go for it and don't look back and always dream big because you don't know where that where that where those big dreams will take you they could take you to somewhere even bigger than you initially thought that you want to initially initially you thought that you would want to be at so it was so fantastic to hear from Steph and I also like to thank Steph for her um her service to um the the, the Royal Air Force here in the UK um it is it, it it must be a huge honor to work um um for um our our military and ensure that um they are looked after and um their needs are met so thank you so very much for that and and I hope 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 you continue to keep flying and inspiring the next generation of um young people um across the UK and around the world um with your story to help to ensure that we can get more young young girls and women into aviation so thank you so much for that Steph Aeronautics um at home for 2021 We'd like to thank you all so much for watching and we hope that you'll you'll you're going to take all of this information forward in the classroom um speak to your teachers about it and uh, tell them that you want to learn more about STEM and aviation and if if you if your teachers agree there's plenty of uh, information available for you uh, on our website that teachers can use um teachers can use to help you to learn more about um the three the three inspiring um speakers that we've met today but also to help you learn more about the world of um aviation and stem and what it can do for you if you go online we've got um our amy our amy aviation series on youtube which is targeted at uh, children of your age um and you'll get to follow amy as she jour- as she journeys through her pathway um in aviation and aerospace and you'll certainly learn a lot from le- learn a lot from it and you'll be able, you'll be able to relate the story to some of our speakers that 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 we've had today because Amy goes on actually Amy actually goes on a very similar journey to them. If you go on our um, on our careers in aerospace website you'll also have access to our online school resources and these these are fantastic puzzles and challenges and activities for you to do. There's also information on there for your teachers to use um so that they can help you um help you learn more about what we do here at um what we do here what we do here in aerospace. You can also um catch all of you, this video um will be produced on our the Royal Air Force Society YouTube channel and um it is available for you to watch at any time. Along with this we have a lot of information um from she maps where if you want if you if, if it was drones that fascinated you you can find out a lot more about the importance of drones and how you can how can you can use them um in your daily lives. If you if it was the the buzz and thrill of being an air traffic controller that inspired you Then you can see more information um about becoming an air traffic controller um on our careers in aerospace website. If you want to find out more about uh, becoming an aircraft engineer, then you can also visit the Airbus website. Um and also on our careers in aerospace website, we have profiles from Christopher Jeeves and Steph Smith so you can read further into their stories and um give these stories pass these stories on to anyone anybody that you want anybody that you like um be it a teacher or a parent and you'll be able to learn so much more about the industry at we are the royal air force society is on facebook and um uh, on instagram as well so just please um uh, find us um at raes careers on all platforms and finally i'd like to thank um, our team here at the royal air force society 
um, who we all, uh, who all um, work, have worked hard to help um, put this put this session together. We very much hope to bring you more more of these in the future, so we can continue to inspire you um, to help you uh, help you to learn. Always keep continue learning about the about um, aviation and all things STEM. So, on behalf of the Royal Aeronautical Society, a, a very big thank you to our speakers, Paul and Paul and Karen. We'd also like to thank Christopher Jeeves and Nicole Colovati, and we'd also like to thank Steph Smith for their time today. And we very much hope to welcome you all back soon. For now, um, take care, keep, keep your head pointed towards the sky and dream big. Thank you.